Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first research keynote of our two-day symposium, Journalism in the Time of Crisis. Uh, my name is Alan Thompson. I'm the program head of the journalism program here at Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, our, our guest for this research keynote is Dr. Richard Fletcher, who's gonna speak to us in just a moment. Uh, Richard is a senior research fellow and leads the research team at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. I think you can see his beautiful office in the background there. Apparently it's a nice day at Oxford. Uh, he's primarily interested in global trends in digital news consumption, comparative media research, the use of social media by journalists and news organizations, and more broadly, the relationship between technology and journalism. Today, he'll review the highlights of a major Reuters study navigating the infodemic and also update us with some more current research. Uh, for the infodemic study, researchers used survey data to document and understand how people in six countries, Argentina, Germany, South Korea, Spain, the UK, and the US, how those people accessed news and information about COVID-19 in the early stages of the pandemic, how they rated the trustworthiness of the different sources and platforms they rely on, and how much misinformation they said they had encountered. So all this to say, Richard's research covers much of the territory we hope to examine in the next two days, and we're very privileged to have him with us. Uh, I'll be your moderator, but really for most of the next uh, 25 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Richard to take us through his research. He'll be using some slides for that. Just so that you're aware, watching this on the Socio platform, you can pose questions. You use the Q&A tab. Uh, at the bottom of your screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, once Richard has finished his presentation, I will see those questions and I'll, I'll put them to Richard in the time we have, which will take us to about 10.45. So uh, Richard, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for the kind introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you all today from, uh, from here in Oxford. I have some slides, so I'll just uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can you can all see that now. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, journalism during coronavirus, but I'm going to do it in quite a specific way. I'm going to talk about it through through data on news audiences, which is really uh, one of the main ways we try to uh, study journalism here at the the Voice Institute uh, at Oxford. Of course, this is only one way in which we can we can understand. Uh, journalism uh, during the coronavirus crisis, but I think it's a particularly important one uh, because journalism and news really does exist within the context of its audience. Uh, and that, as I said, is, is one of our key starting points uh, when we're thinking about something like this uh, here at the Institute. And I think it was very clear from, from the beginning uh, of the coronavirus crisis that not only was this a, a public health crisis, but it was also uh, a communications uh, emergency, simply because communication is absolutely central uh, to uh, how we respond uh, as societies. And I think the WHO sort of understood this uh, quite early on when they said we're not just fighting uh, an epidemic, we're fighting uh, an infodemic uh, back in uh, mid-February. I think the infodemic term really uh, speaks to some of the issues around misinformation, which are, of course, very, very important. But I think part of how we think about communication during coronavirus is also about how people access good, reliable uh, information and whether they can actually do that. Uh, and I think this is, this is the main focus of, of, of some of our research onto uh, coronavirus. And in order to really understand that, I think we have to come back to some quite basic questions uh, about the media uh, and its audience, such as how do people get news about coronavirus? If they get it, do they trust it? And how much do people know? Does that trust translate into knowledge and does that inform the way they behave? These are old questions, they're not new questions, but I think they're particularly important during a situation uh, like coronavirus. And these are the key questions we've tried to answer uh, with some of our recent research here uh, at the Reuters Institute. As Alan has already mentioned, uh, we have two main projects that have looked at uh, coronavirus. 
The first, uh, which we published as a report called Navigating the Infodemic, uh, was based on a survey uh, of six countries, uh, the UK, the US, Spain, Germany, Korea, and Argentina. This research was conducted quite near the beginning of the coronavirus crisis in, in many countries, in some cases, just as they were entering uh, lockdown uh, in, a, in early April 2020. Uh, my co-authors, Rasmus Nielsen, uh, Scott Brennan, Nick Newman, and, and Philip Howe published this uh, later that month uh, with support uh, from the Oxford Martin School and in conjunction with the, the Oxford uh, Internet Institute. This was a study of six countries, as said. We also followed this up uh, with the UK COVID-19 News and Information Project, which was based on a series of 10 surveys uh, in the UK uh, with the same people uh, running from mid-April uh, to mid-August. And obviously this, this offers a different perspective uh, on the coronavirus from the, from the navigating the infodemic study. It's narrower uh, because it, of course, only focuses on, on one country, uh, the UK, uh, but it has more depth. And I think these, these two can be uh, combined uh, to help us understand uh, what's happening more broadly. I'll refer to data from both dur during this talk, but I think it is important to point out before going any further that even though this is a six country study and a one country study, um, this will not necessarily be representative of the situation uh, globally or in every, in every country. Uh, the crisis is clearly playing out very differently in very different parts of the world. And countries, as we know, have very different media systems, different relationships with media and politics and different roles that the, the media plays uh, within those societies. It's very important to point that out, I think. Uh, but at the same time, I still think there are, there are some sort of key takeaways that hopefully will be applicable uh, in other countries uh, across the world. So let's start by thinking about COVID-19 news access, really one of the most basic questions we can ask uh, about the role of news and journalism uh, during the crisis. And we started it by thinking about this in the infodemic study by looking at uh, all the different sources and their reach uh, for coronavirus news uh, and information in the six countries that we studied. We asked people whether they received coronavirus news and information from, from news organizations, from government, from health organizations, scientists, uh, ordinary people, uh, and, and, and various other potential sources uh, of information. And what was clear from this uh, at first was that no one source can reach the whole of the population uh, on its own. Uh, clearly, uh, even for those who are, who are getting news and information about coronavirus, it'll often be a combination of different sources. Having said that, it's also clear that news organizations are the most widely used way, or at least were at the beginning of April, the most widely used way of getting news and information about coronavirus in these six countries. Around three quarters, uh, as the crisis peaked in some of these countries, around three quarters said that they used news organizations as a source of news and information about uh, coronavirus uh, in the last week, ahead of government, health organizations, experts, uh, and ordinary people. And it's also clear that even when some of these uh, other actors or organizations do reach audiences, it's almost certainly in part due to uh, news coverage and, and the fact that they've been featured uh, in, in news uh, about coronavirus. That was back in April. Uh, and in some cases, as we've seen from other studies and we can see from our study in the UK, this seems to have been the point at which early April when news use really peaked. Uh, this isn't surprising, of course, there was new important information that almost everyone needed to know at that point. Uh, but this chart shows the proportion of people that say they accessed coronavirus news at least once a day on average uh, over time. And we can clearly see a decline uh, from uh, mid-April uh, through to uh, the end, uh, sorry, mid-August. In the UK, a decline from 79% to 57%. And we can think about this in, in, a, in a slightly different way. So this chart shows the, the proportion of most, most read news stories uh, from the BBC, the Guardian uh, and the Mail uh, that were about coronavirus. And you can see uh, in April, 
through to roughly June, uh, almost 100% of the most read news stories were about coronavirus. Uh, but after, uh, from June onwards, this started to fall quite quickly uh, to around half of the most read news stories. If you remember, this was a time when uh, there were other news stories like the, the Black Lives Matter protests in the US, for example, and the coronavirus slightly slipped down uh, the news agenda, uh, at least uh, in the UK. Some of the reasons for this are, of course, due to supply, as I've just mentioned, but it's also to do with the changing nature of the crisis. Uh, but also, there is some evidence that people at this point started to actively avoid news uh, about coronavirus. Uh, as we saw a slight rise from April uh, through to roughly June, when those who said they actively avoid the news rose from 15% uh, to 25%. Uh, and all, almost all of this, as we found out in a follow-up question, uh, is about avoiding news to do with coronavirus. This is in the UK. Why do people actually avoid the news about coronavirus? Well, we asked another follow-up question. And by far and away, the clearest reason uh, that people gave, or the, the standout reason, was that people felt that it was having a, a bad effect uh, on their mood. Uh, around a third said that they felt like there was simply too much news at that point. About a third said it was because they didn't feel they could trust the news. And just under a third said that they didn't feel like there was any point because they couldn't do anything uh, with the information. This, of course, news avoidance is only a sort of small part of the picture, but I think it's, it's interesting to note how news avoidance grew quite quickly uh, during the early part of the crisis in the UK and then didn't, didn't go back to normal levels uh, over, over, over the summer even as the, the nature of the crisis uh, began to change. And I think it is still quite just striking in general that, that a small but significant minority, even during coronavirus, didn't think that the news was, was meeting their needs. Regardless of the, of the reasons for why people might have turned away from the news uh, during this point, uh, a key point is that different groups started to turn away from the news at different speeds. So this is something that we wrote about in a report that we published several months ago, uh, which is available on our website that focused on coronavirus news uh, inequalities uh, in the UK. As we can see, uh, the chart on the left shows the gap between news use between under 55s and over 55s. So again, this is the proportion of people from each group who say they access coronavirus news at least uh, once a day on average. And as you can see, over time, uh, the gap between the over 55s and the under 55s actually grew. Uh, so it was smaller uh, in April, but by August uh, was, was slightly larger. And this we think represents a growing inequality by age when it comes to coronavirus uh, news use. The chart on the right is the same, but for, for education. So here we compare uh, the group with a university degree with the group without a university degree. And we can see that although the size of the, the gap between these two groups didn't grow uh, over time, it still exists. And it was present at the start uh, of April through to the end of August. And this, of course, still matters uh, during uh, a crisis like coronavirus. Um, these gaps, I think it's fair to say, represent long-standing inequalities when it comes uh, to news use, for example, between young and old, men and women, rich and poor, and so on. But I think they're, they're, they're sort of thrown into even sharper relief during a situation like coronavirus, which often requires a, a collective response from all parts of society in order to uh, deal with it. Uh, effectively, so these gaps really matter. But another way to think about it, which I think is also particularly interesting, is the fact that in some cases, like with AIDS, these gaps are actually smaller at the beginning uh, of the crisis. And I think this shows that these are not laws of nature, these are not things that are set in stone. And, and if the message is important enough and is conveyed in the right way, then these gaps can, we can do something about them. Access to news, of course, is just one part of this much larger, much more complicated issue. And I think it's important to realize that the extent to which people will actually 
respond to information in the news or act on it in some way depends on their attitudes towards it. And of course, key attitudes that we want to consider is trust. How much do people trust news and information about coronavirus? And I think trust is always important, but particularly important during a situation like coronavirus, because the information often implies some kind of response or requires some kind of response. People need to be able to feel confident that they should act on it. I think the first thing we can say about trust more generally is that many uh, countries enter the coronavirus crisis with relatively low levels of trust uh, in the news. Uh, this data is from our digital news report project, which is an ongoing annual survey of news audiences in, in 40 different countries. And what we saw from that when we collected data um, in uh, late January, early February this year, was that uh, around 38% of people across all those countries said that they trust most news most of the time. And although it's not always clear what we should compare this to, I think it's fair to say that's quite a low figure. Perhaps more importantly, figures have been declining since we first started measuring this in 2015. And the chart on the right shows that decline in, in some countries. It's not declining in all countries, uh, but in many of the countries, particularly those which previously enjoyed high levels of trust in the news, we have seen a decline. And this was the situation uh, we face as we, as we entered the coronavirus crisis uh, in 2020. What's perhaps most interesting is that this wasn't really reflected uh, in, the, in the early part uh, of the coronavirus crisis. So this is uh, some data we collected as part of the Navigating the Epidemic study. And what it shows is that trust in news about coronavirus, as measured uh, at the beginning of April, um, was much higher than our measure of trust in most news most of the time from the digital news report. Uh, you can see in some cases, such as the UK, uh, Korea, Argentina, and the US, the, the, the sort of trust was almost twice as widespread in news about coronavirus than it was about the news in general. Now, these measures are quite different, so we should be a bit cautious in, in, in making a direct comparison between them, but I don't think the sort of slight differences in the way the question was worded and the, and the sort of slight differences in the nature of the question can really be on their own explaining such, such large differences. I think it's really more likely to be to, be, to, be to do with something about the, the serious nature of the topic and the fact that in some countries, uh, the coverage, particularly in the UK, for example, was, was quite cautious at this early stage and strongly tied to uh, official messaging. Um, and I think this is something that the, the sort of public recognized and, 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 and sort of changed their attitudes in this way. What's interesting, and this is shown on the chart on the right, is that this seemed to mirror an effect that we saw in some countries called rally around the flag, where approval for national leaders seemed to uh, uptick um, at, at, the, at the moment in which the, the crisis was, was becoming uh, more acute. And we, we turned this the rally around the news as we, we thought we were seeing something similar uh, to do uh, with trust. When it comes to trust and news, I think there's one final point which I think is, is worth keeping in mind is that although the, the, the trust in coronavirus news was, was higher perhaps than we were expecting, uh, still lower than uh, trust in news and information from, for example, scientists, uh, health organizations and so on, but, but higher than we were uh, expecting. At the same time, people also seem to reflect quite positively, I think, on, on how the media had helped them uh, during that early stage uh, of the crisis. So around 60% across the six countries uh, that we surveyed said the news media had helped them understand uh, the pandemic so far. And around 60% thought that the media had explained what they should do in response to the pandemic. It wasn't entirely positive, around 30% uh, across all six countries said that they thought the media had maybe exaggerated the crisis even at this early stage, but again, not, not the same issue as trust, but still quite positive evaluations uh, for the media uh, at this stage. 
But like the rally around the flag effect enjoyed by some national leaders, uh, in the UK at least, uh, it seems that trust in coronavirus news and information from news organisations uh, began to wane quite quickly. So trust in news organisations for news about coronavirus fell from 57% uh, in mid-April uh, to uh, around 45% uh, by June, uh, where it more or less stayed through till, till August. I think the key point here is that, that trust is not an inherent good. Um, trust uh, could be a sign of, of healthy skepticism, and I think most people would, would welcome that when it comes to, to news coverage, but I think at the same time, it's important to recognize that uh, for some, this is not just healthy skepticism, it, it's hardened cynicism in some cases. So not only do around a quarter to a, uh, one third of the UK population think that uh, news organizations are a concerning source of false and misleading information about coronavirus, perhaps more shockingly, around 35% in August thought that the news media had actually made the coronavirus crisis worse. Now, I think this is something that's very, probably very particular to the UK uh, in a country where it has, has been very sort of severely affected by coronavirus. And there are, there, are, there are many people who have had serious questions about, about the official response. Um, but it's still striking nonetheless that in a country like the UK, so many people could, could hold this view. But how does this translate into how much people know about coronavirus and then perhaps how they behave uh, in response to it. In our initial navigating the epidemic study uh, in April, we decided to ask people some basic questions uh, about coronavirus to see how much they knew. Uh, we adapted the questions from the WHO's own Mythbusters website, uh, which uh, aimed to uh, take some common uh, misperceptions about coronavirus and correct them. These were fairly easy to adapt into, into simple true or false questions. Uh, you can see the questions that we asked uh, there on, on the slide. Perhaps encouragingly, uh, most people in most countries uh, got, uh, well, sorry, most people in all countries got most of the questions correct. So three or more, 86% uh, got three or more rights in the UK. Slightly low figures elsewhere, but still most people get most of these questions uh, correct. At this stage of the crisis, it's important to point out that hard facts were, were quite difficult to come by compared to many other things we might want to ask people about. Uh, so it can be difficult to put some of this into context, but I think it's, you know, these are things that ultimately the WHO thought that people might not know. And I think it was encouraging that, that so many people uh, seem to do quite well on this measure. Uh, as we wrote in the epidemic report, uh, those who uh, rely on news organizations uh, for information about coronavirus tended to score uh, slightly better uh, than the average. And we didn't find any evidence that those who rely on social media in particular uh, score any, any worse. Again, we, we followed this up uh, in the UK. Uh, here, we found similarly high scores. Uh, the questions were, were different, we used multiple choice instead of true false. Uh, and we had a mixture of questions about what people need to do to stay safe based on official advice from the NHS or, or the government and mix those with questions about uh, current affairs. So you can see two examples here. We asked uh, respondents if they could identify the country in Europe which had had the least strict lockdown, that's Sweden. Uh, uh, and in, uh, in the second question, we asked people uh, how long uh, the NHS advised them to, to wash their hands for. This was quite a well-known sort of piece of advice for people in the UK. I think they'd recognize it, it might be different to elsewhere, but this is how it was communicated. Um, and again, we saw that most people in the UK answered most of these questions correctly. And I think this, this sort of added to our beliefs that uh, the public compared to something like politics, it's regular, uh, people are regularly asked in surveys, you know, polit about political facts to measure their political knowledge. And we, we're used to seeing quite low scores uh, in, in measures like this. So this was slightly unusual in, in that people tended to score very well. Of course, it depends on the questions, but I think this, is, this was quite encouraging. 
And I think it's possible that some of this knowledge, and this is something we're going to work to, to test uh, in future research, has fed into uh, an increased awareness or willingness about coronavirus rules. And again, this is data uh, from the UK. Uh, we asked people uh, how often they observed uh, each piece of each of these five pieces of advice, which are official government advice uh, in the UK and available on their, on their website and strongly communicated through, through the news media. We asked people how often they stick to it. Now, it's very important here that these are self-reports and this shouldn't be, uh, you know, sort of seen as an exact precise measure of what people actually do. We know that self-reports and actual behavior can, can differ uh, in some cases, but again, I think it is a sign of, of people's sort of awareness and theoretical willingness, if you like, to, to sort of observe, observe the rules. And we saw that although the numbers do go down slightly over time, around 60% uh, in the beginning of June said that they uh, wash their hands regularly, uh, stay two meters apart, uh, take the option of working from home, limit their contact with other people uh, and stay at home as much as possible. But this numbers fell to around 50% uh, by uh, mid-August with the exception of hand washing, which seemed to stay at a, at a fairly constant level. We see a similar picture when we asked about uh, preventative steps or willingness to take preventative steps uh, to help uh, combat coronavirus. So we asked people whether they would be willing, for example, uh, to take a test if offered, to take a vaccine, uh, to self-isolate, uh, and so on. And again, we see quite high willingness to, to do this uh, in theory. There is some hesitation, as you can see from the bar at the bottom, about downloading and using a, a coronavirus app, tracing app. Uh, this, is, this is something we've seen in other, in other research, when I think it's perhaps slightly reflected in some of the the data and uptake we've seen uh, from the UK. So that is the slight exception. Uh, but on the whole, generally high willingness to take preventive measures. Again, we need to be cautious because there's other data emerging now that even as people report high willingness to, to do some of these things, when, when they're faced with a situation of having to self-isolate, for example, the, the practicalities of life uh, can, can, can get in the way. Uh, and although people might not stick to 100% to of the time, they might generally be willing uh, to do so. But it's important, again, to reiterate, these are not measures of actual behavior. It's, it's more theoretical willingness to behave in a certain way. But again, I think it presents a reasonably positive uh, picture. Now, I'd like to, 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 to sort of start to wrap up by thinking about how we can summarize all of this and, and and what it means as we, we move into the uh, second wave uh, of the crisis, at least in many countries uh, in Europe, that's, what, that's the stage at which we're at now. Now, together with uh, Rasmus Nielsen, uh, Antonis Kalagaropoulos and Felix Simon, who are my uh, colleagues on the, on the UK uh, Coronavirus uh, News and Information Project, um, I think we can start to uh, work towards some of the, identifying some of the key challenges, but also before we do that, perhaps some of the positive uh, points which I've already emphasized. So first, as we've seen, with some exceptions, of course, most of the UK public do seem to be informed about coronavirus. They've mostly showed a willingness to follow government guidelines and also to take precautionary measures. Yet at the same time, there's a key challenge around how we deal with information equality around coronavirus news. Remember the gaps we saw between young and old, uh, between uh, uh, educated and, and lower levels of formal, formal education. And then finally, how, could, how can we think about the, the parts of the public who are, who, who are currently not being served uh, or, or whose information needs are not currently being met? Think, for example, of those people who have used news very infrequently or perhaps have very low levels of trust in the news, or perhaps both. What can we do then? I think this is perhaps you know, something we can discuss, and I think there are, there are already some, some options available. I think, although it may be challenging to reach some of these uh, groups, we, we, we should consider uh, the use of different uh, platforms that are perhaps more popular uh, amongst low news users or the young. 
Uh, and also think about the role that, that sort of large uh, popular news outlets in certain countries can play, even if they are uh, perhaps not necessarily seen as uh, the most, um, sort of not necessarily seen as the same sort of level of uh, sort of reporting and, and quality, if you like, as some outlets, they still have a very large reach. How, how can they be used uh, in the crisis? And I think for the broader public, who again seem to be mostly informed, open to suggestions and, and, and cautious, uh, how can, and I think the issue there is more to do with trust. And I think that it's clear there's no shortage of, of information. And we saw early on in the crisis that people can access information and are willing to access information if they need to. Then the question might be more to do with trust rather than access. And then I think it may be important to think about some of the, the sort of relatively uncontroversial sources of news and information that we've also identified in our work, such as scientists, doctors, nurses, health organizations, and so on. How can they be used as a, as a source of uh, information as opposed to perhaps politicians and pundits? I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I welcome any questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Richard. Um, as I expected from the outset, you've pretty much taken us through the whole agenda for these two days. So uh, thanks for that. And I just wanna remind people watching, the Q&A uh, tab down in the bottom is where you can you can post some questions. Um, I just wanted to ask one while I wait for some questions to roll in. Uh, why the choice of looking at audiences rather than the journalism, right? This is a basic choice about the way you do the research by, by gauging the audience rather than trying to assess the journalism itself? Well, uh, I think that, as, as I said at the beginning, I think this is this is just one way of, uh, of looking at it. And I think the, a completely different way, but just as potentially revealing, uh, is, is to look at journalism. I think that when we started with the uh, infodemic study, I think it was clear even at that point that, um, you know, the, this, was a, this was a new problem there was, a, there was a lack of information. What contribution could we make uh, relatively quickly and, and provide robust uh, sort of evidence-based information to, to, to help uh, those who needed to navigate this particular crisis? And I think surveys for all of their, their sort of limitations uh, do offer a way to get robust data quickly. And we thought we, thought we, could, we could make a contribution. Um, when it comes to thinking about journalism, I think you quickly get into issues about uh, quality and assessing quality and informativeness and other dimensions if you look particularly at content. And I think that um, that is not only very difficult, it's, it's very time consuming to do well. I think these studies will, will come uh, in time and they'll be very valuable when they do arrive. Um, but that wasn't, we didn't think we could make that kind of we thought our time was best at making a different kind of contribution at, at that point. Yeah. I think there are also, of course, other issues which others have, have done some very interesting work on to do with the, the, the pressures placed on, on, on journalists during, uh, during coronavirus and sort of issues of that nature, uh, which again, I think are, uh, will take longer to do well. And I'm glad to see that people are doing that, but I think this was something that we thought, felt we could do and make a contribution uh, at the time. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to questions. I, I see one here from somebody identified, Joshua Beanlands. Uh, have you considered future research comparing attitudes and news consumption among people who have been affected by COVID-19, uh, either personally or from a, a family member, comparing those affected with those not and what the news meant to them? Absolutely, yeah. I think this, um, uh, you know, again, can be quite challenging. I think the um, not only do you have to sort of think about how you can do this in a in a sort of appropriate and, and sort of sensitive way, even in something like a survey. Um, there's also sort of more sort of practical issues to do with the, the, the fact that only relatively small numbers of people have been fortunately, uh, you know, sort of affected, severely affected by coronavirus. Um, but this is something we have measured uh, in the in, in the UK study. Uh, it's not Again, it's not the easiest thing to measure, but we have we have tried to do it, and I think this is something we want to try to bring out uh, with uh, further analysis. Because I completely agree with uh, Joshua when he when he sort of identifies this as a potentially uh, important 
sort of factor for, for thinking about things like trust or even news access. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague, Sarah Everts, who did our uh, excellent interview with Ed Young from the Atlantic, uh, poses a question. So she's noting that, that Ed said in his Q&A, the magazine has seen a rise in subscriptions over the COVID-19 pandemic. He suggests a rise in public trust in the magazine. And he attributed that, at least in part, to their conscious editorial strategy to do big picture analysis pictures, the pieces to contextualize the crisis instead of this sort of fire hose of news stories. Uh, what do you think of the strategy of doing bigger picture pieces as a way to improve uh, trust in the media? I think um, certainly for a, uh, a certain section of the, of the sort of the news reading public or the news audience, that, that is something that, that has, I think has a good chance of working. And I think Ed's a great example of, of, of how that can be done well. Um, when it comes, I think sort of trust and subscriptions are perhaps a slightly sort of different issue. Uh, and I think the, the surge in subscriptions that, that, that sort of many publishers have, have reported, I think that um, I can see the logic of how that, that could happen in, 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 during a situation like coronavirus. I wonder, and I think it would be very interesting to see how that, how that plays out in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it comes to trust, we, I think this is much more interesting as a, as a long term trend. Uh, and I think that, as I said, for, for a certain part of the, of the public, that's very important. Uh, for, for, for the other part, it perhaps, it perhaps will be less important and perhaps I think as going back to something I mentioned in the talk, I think, and this is, this is the value of studying sort of content and being able to combine it with audience data. I, I wonder whether we might see uh, a difference in, 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 in the type of news coverage that we're seeing, particularly at the beginning of, uh, of lockdown in certain countries and, and, and how that could perhaps be linked to trust. Because I think there is, given that many of the, um, when we ask people about why they have low trust in the news, for example, one of the most frequently mentioned uh, terms was bias, which is kind of a catch-all term for kind of general sort of grievances with the media. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people felt that the news coverage at that point was 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 slightly different, uh, and, and and that may in some way explain the uh, the level of trust. I mean, you also talked about this challenge of clearly identify in the early research the age gap in terms of trust and consumption of media and whether or not the deeply contextual uh, long pieces are, are gonna address that gap or, or do we need journalism at both ends of the spectrum? Absolutely, I mean, I think that's, that's the point about, I think the, the journalism like this is, 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 is gonna be very highly valued, I think, from, uh, from a certain part of the, uh, of, the, of the news audience, but it's not, it's just not realistic, I think, to expect everyone to to mm -hmm. to particularly value that 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 kind of journalism. And I think the the kind of journalism that is you know, primarily about sort of communicating sort of important information to people who are perhaps not going to spend a long time reading a a, a long sort of informative piece. That's just as important, of course. And I think in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a crisis like coronavirus, it's, I think it's, it gains in, in importance. Okay, we've still got uh, three or four minutes left. Uh, I see I have a question from Nicole Blanchette at Ryerson. You mentioned theoretical willingness, re-following government regulations. Is there also an element of theory re-self-reporting of whether survey respondents have seen misinformation on COVID-19 that they are able to identify what may not be accurate? It's, it's not something that we have really done a lot of research on. As, as I mentioned, I think our, our sort of focus was looking at how people get what we generally think of as, as sort of good, reliable information. I think there have been studies on, on, on misinformation, uh, particularly around uh, coronavirus, a lot of research in, from the US uh, in particular. Um, and I think this sort of, there are some interesting findings starting to emerge I and mean, they've already identified um, certain groups that are perhaps more prone to, to misinformation, also certain attitudes that seem to correlate with the sort of higher likelihood of, of belief in misinformation. But again, it's, it's still quite early stages. One of the interesting findings from that research, I think, was 
although there's, we have good evidence to show that um, older people are more likely to share false information on social media, it seems that, uh, at least in the studies we have, that younger people are actually more prone to believing uh, misinformation about mm -hmm. coronavirus. And I think that not only highlights the difference between sort of the behaviors around sharing and, and belief, but also uh, it sort of tallies with, with what we found in our research about uh, um, which groups are, are consuming sort of less information and which uh, are most, perhaps more vulnerable to misinformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, my colleague Chris Waddell here at Carleton, uh, who is on a panel later this morning on public trust, asks, uh, in your survey of multiple countries, did you find significant differences between countries on any specific issues related to COVID-19? And do you have any thoughts on why that may be the case, why there were such differences across different countries? Well, I think that um, we are used to seeing differences in, in trust across countries. Um, in our in our forty country survey, which I which I mentioned, uh, the sort of figure for the proportion of people who trust most news most of the time ranges from about uh, fifty five percent in a country like Finland, down to around twenty percent in in countries like Greece and, and Korea. I mean, these are these are all the countries in that survey are are sort of high income, uh, you know, sort of countries with a certain level of of, of um, you know, a certain score on the Human Development Index, for example. Uh, so, but even within this sort of quite similar group, we, we see huge variation on, on something like trust in the news. What was interesting is that the, that variation seemed much smaller when we asked about coronavirus, uh, trusting coronavirus news, admittedly only in, in six countries. Uh, but I would certainly expect to see uh, a lot of variation, but we didn't ask in the survey about specific issues. We asked it sort of in general terms about, about trust and around proportion, we didn't have any data on on specific attitudes towards specific things about coronavirus. So we've got about a minute left. I just, I wanted to ask you, and I think I'm, I'm gonna try and end every panel this way. Uh, you spoke a little bit about this, but what's the lesson? What's the lesson here going forward for, for journalists uh, from, the, from what's happened in, in, in this eight month period? I mean, I think I would uh, so partially sort of go back to what I said, towards the end, I think we can, we have evidence at least, and this is mostly from the UK. And again, I wanna stress that might not be true to everywhere, but we, I think we have evidence that people are, are willing uh, and knowledgeable uh, to, to respond in what we might think of as the right way uh, to coronavirus. So I don't think that's, that's the challenge. I, th I think the, 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 the challenge is around, given that we need to some degree respond collectively to, to coronavirus. I think the challenge is how do we focus our attention not on the people who are kind of always going to be well served by the news, but how do we focus on those who are who are being underserved at the moment? And I think here there's a, a key role for relying on certain types of expertise as opposed to others. Uh, and also thinking about how, you know, for example, for, for those who want to communicate information, whether it's health organizations or, or governments or politicians, you know, what, what's going to work best for this, for this group of people? And it may not be, um, you know, through sort of the, the sort of kind of prestige sort of outlets that are used by the, the group, I think, are already well served. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, this has been great. Uh, so that's been uh, Richard Fletcher from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at University of Oxford. That was our research keynote. And uh, again, thank you very much, Richard. Thanks everyone for joining us. And you can move on to our next panel, Watchdog versus Megaphone. Thanks very much. <laughs>